This morning what we're going to do is uh, Andrew Farley is going to share with us via video, um, and he has a sermon uh, on the Good Shepherd, uh, which is the same thing that we were going to look at this morning. So uh, I, love, I love what he has to say and what he has to share with us this morning. So this morning is gonna, we're going to continue in our I Am series, uh, looking at I Am the Good Shepherd, and then Andrew will be here in person next week. Uh, for I Am the Resurrection and the Life, and then we will finish up our Christmas series uh, on Christmas Eve, December 24th, here at 4 o'clock. So uh, pay attention to the video. It's, it's really, really a good message about what it means that God, that Jesus is our good shepherd, and what does it mean to be that, that we're his sheep and to be led by such a good shepherd. All right, and then we'll circle back afterwards and talk about it. All righty, thank you. The Good Shepherd, a passage that for me, honestly, meant very little. Growing up, I would hear a sermon here or there about Jesus as the Good Shepherd. I would nod my head in agreement and then move along with my life. To be honest with you, it meant very little to me. And yet at the same time, I had a pretty morbid view of God. Some of you know my story, but... What you may not realize is that in the backdrop of all that occurred in my teenage years, I had a pretty ugly view of God. My view was that God was constantly trying to teach me a lesson. He was trying to put me in a corner and humble me and break me and teach me a lesson. I didn't really see him as good. I saw him as a taskmaster maybe as a professor, at best, a disciplinarian, and I didn't really know him as good. I thought that his main goal was to get me new information, to teach me a lesson, to put me in my place. And the last thing on my mind was God's heart, his good heart, his heart of goodness toward me. And what I love about this passage is it's going to show us a God who is good, a God who wants good for us, a God who has even made us good. So let's look at this passage because I think that it has incredible things for us as a church. We wrestle with God's goodness. Jesus says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep but he climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. What's he talking about? Well, he's talking about false teachers. He's talking about people who uh, distract us and get alternate views of God in place for us. They're pushing and promoting unhealthy views of God in the name of religion. Now, remember that... He's talking primarily to the Jews at this point. There are probably no Gentiles present, a few if any. And so they're used to the Pharisees, the religious zealots. They're used to all of the leaders of Israel dictating what God looks like. Imagine getting your view of God from a Pharisee. Imagine getting your view of God from a religious zealot under the law. Well, this was the norm. If God is good, you would only hear about him th through those mouthpieces. And so Jesus is saying there are some who try to come in uh, to disturb and to distort the gospel message. There are some who come in and, and actually twist the character of God, not letting us see his heart for who he really is. Don't be duped. Don't be tricked. Don't be suckered by the sales pitch of a God who is a bean counter up in heaven, constantly keeping score. Jesus is about to present that he himself dictates what God looks like because he is the exact representation of the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. He's going to tell us, you want to know what Gad looks like? I'm the door and I'm the gate and you look to me and you'll begin to see his goodness. 
but the one who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. Now, this has to do with God's plan. There are people trying to climb over the gate. You could say that their climbing is a, a religious climbing. Remember Paul in the book of Romans, he says it doesn't depend on a man who wills or a man who runs. But there are religious people who are trying to use willpower and trying to run their way into the kingdom. They're trying to climb their way into heaven by some other way. And yet Jesus is announcing he's the way, he's the door, he's the gate, he's the plan of God. The plan is a person. The plan is not a three-step program of betterment of your behavior. The plan is a person. And so Jesus is the good shepherd. He enters by the door. He's the real shepherd of these sheep. To him, to Jesus that is, to him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep listen to his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. I love this because it alludes to the fact that we the church, we as new creations, we as God's family, we know his voice. Do you realize that you're being led by a shepherd? We sometimes wait for leading. We're tempted to do this in a new age fashion, in an eastern mysticism way. We don't realize it, but a lot of eastern ideas, a lot of new agey type ideas have crept into Christianity. You know, the human race is pagan essentially pagan by nature without Christ. And so we are looking to be led. And the first thing we imagine is an external leading coming to us. And we look for signs and wonders. Much like the Greeks looked for wisdom and the Jews were constantly trying to read the tea leaves, trying to figure out prophecies. We're trying to be led by external voices we're looking for sky riding in the sky. You remember my teenage years. I mentioned moments ago. I would believe that God was speaking to me through random acts that were occurring in front of me. I'd pull up at an intersection and there might be a word on the license plate in front of me. And that's how God was speaking to me. I was desperate to hear from God. I was desperate to be led. And we are today, I can't tell you how many times people have called in to our radio broadcast. They're wondering if this is a leading and if this is a leading and if this is God's will and if this is God's message to them. We want a voice and we want to hear it. We want to be led. We need to be led. What I love about this passage is that the leading of God is described but it's described in an innate way. You know what I mean by innate? That we're sheep and he's the shepherd and it's instinctive for us to know his voice. It's just instinct. You call your dog and he comes. He knows your name, so to speak. He knows your voice. He knows who you are. And so there's an instinctive response and that's what we have built in. Have you ever heard a false teaching? And you didn't know why it was false. You just knew it was false. There's something wrong with that. I can't quite put my finger on it, but it's off base. Do you recognize that you have spiritual instincts? There's a built-in discernment about you. You know the voice of the Father. You know the truth that sets you free. And when something is not setting you free, alarms start to go off. You might hear something in church buildings. You might read something in Christian books. You might watch something on Christian television programs. And alarms go off inside of you. That doesn't quite jive with the truth that sets me free. I know it's not right. I know there's something off about it. It's because we're sheep. And we know the shepherd, and he knows us. When he puts all his own sheep outside, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. 
You see it again? There's an instinctive knowing. You know Jesus. There are people that will tell you that you need to know Jesus. You need to know God more and you need to know Jesus. You know what the new covenant announces? They will all know me from the least to the greatest. We celebrate forgiveness and that's awesome. That's in the new covenant. We celebrate righteousness and that's amazing. That's part of the new covenant. But do you recognize that part of the new covenant is that you know Jesus. They will all know me from the least to the greatest. There is an instinctive knowing. God goes even further and says, we will not have to teach each other. Know the Lord because they will all know me. I won't have to say to you, please know Jesus. Even as I utter those words in your direction, know Jesus, your response would be, I do. I don't know everything about Scripture. I don't know everything about the Bible. I don't know everything about the gospel. But I know Jesus instinctively. I know his voice. I know his presence inside of me. I'm still learning and growing, but I know the Christ. And so he says, we know his voice. Also, isn't it interesting, it says that he went out ahead of us. The scripture says that Jesus is our forerunner. That he went into the Holy of Holies ahead of us and then invited us in. You know, that's part of the message to any Jewish person. For thousands of years, they were not qualified to go into the Holy of Holies. And the message of the gospel is that Jesus went in... He went in ahead, he prepared the way, and then he says, Hey, you, you, come on in too. Come into the forbidden place, the place of holiness, the place of perfection. How can you be invited to the place of perfection if he has not made you perfect? The perfect you. That is the result of the gospel message that God has made us perfectly clean and perfectly close and perfectly righteous by one offering, by one resurrection. He went in ahead. What has God done for you ahead of time? The moment that you step into Christ, you step in as a forgiven person, completely pure before God. We got a lot of Christians who think that they're being forgiven progressively. The most common religious view among conservative Christians in our nation is that Christians are being forgiven progressively. That it's much like me and you in relationship. I offend you. You get offended at me. I apologize to you. You say I forgive you. And we continue on in a progressive relationship where I am getting right with you On Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, this is the average conservative Christian view in the United States. And we don't even realize it. We've taken a little bit of Catholic theology, a little bit of Protestantism. We've mashed it together, eliminated the priest, eliminated the confession booth, eliminated the mass, and yet... We're teaching a progressive forgiveness as I fire up an apology to God and he beams down a little bit more cleansing my way. Is that the gospel? No, he went ahead of us and he did everything he needed to do and then he said, it is finished. Hebrews 10, 14 says that by that one offering that is finished, By the cross, by that one sacrifice, you have been made perfect for all time. He went ahead of you. God is good, and he made you good. He made you perfectly good by making you perfectly forgiven. But there's more. He went ahead of you in resurrection. He went ahead of you as the forerunner in resurrection, and he made you righteous. God is good, and he made you good by making you perfectly righteous, perfectly clean and perfectly close and perfectly righteous. And he says, enter in to the holy of holies because you have been made holy. He went ahead of us. He went ahead of us, and now we know his voice. 
But I got to tell you, there's 10,000 voices out there, aren't there? Religious voices that say you need more forgiveness and you need more righteousness and you need more cleansing and you're not right and you don't know Jesus yet and you need more. And if we're not careful, we become suckers for that sales pitch of you need more. However, a stranger, these sheep will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Discernment. The Bible says that Jesus Christ has become our wisdom. He has become our wisdom. He has become our life. He has become our discernment. And so when we hear the voice of strangers, someone who claims to be a shepherd but is no shepherd, someone who claims to be good but is not good, we can intuitively know this doesn't line up with the truth. It's poison. It's not good food. We spit it out and we move along. We dust our feet and we abandon the situation. If you're stuck right now, today, in an abusive situation, I'm talking about an abusive religious leader, an abusive church or congregation. This is not uncommon. This is all over the place. Spiritual abuse and religious abuse is real. And it may be subtle. You deserve the gospel. You deserve the goodness of God now that he has made you his child. Get away from abusive religion and fall at the feet of the finished work of Christ and you will recognize it is good. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. You'll find rest for your soul. It's not abusive and it's not morbid. It's beautiful. We have something the world desperately needs. We have something healthy. We have something good. When the God of the universe makes you good and he goes ahead of you and cleanses you and forgives you and makes you righteous and calls you his and invites you in people need that that's healthy that's good that's great food to feast on we've got the best thing going on the planet jesus told them this figure of speech but guess what no surprise they didn't get it <laughs> they did not understand the things which he was saying to them, he couldn't figure out what they meant. So Jesus said to them again, in other words, he's got to repeat himself in different words now, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. I love this because now he's identified himself as the door. First he said, I go through the door as the good shepherd. Now he says, I am the door. The door is a person. Don't be fooled. The door is not country club religion. The door is not church membership. The door is not tithing. The door is not good behavior. The door is not your best efforts. The door is not sin management. The door is not reducing the bad things you do and increasing the good things you do. That's not the door. The door is a person. His name is Jesus. The shepherd is the door. Christ is the way. Have you called upon behavior improvement or have you called upon the name of Jesus Christ? The door is a person. All those who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. Thank God for that, right? That we didn't all listen to the religious zealots. And again, you have to ask yourself, rewinding 2,000 years ago, you have to ask yourself, who are these thieves and robbers? Are they just demons? Is it Satan and his demons? Perhaps there's an influence there, but I mean, he's talking about the religious people of that day. And it's not pretty what he's saying. He's calling the Pharisees who are proud in their law-keeping... He's calling the, the Jewish zealots who are all into their obedience and dedication and commitment. 
He's calling them thieves and robbers because they come in and they take someone who has a simple childlike faith in Jesus plus nothing and they twist it and they warp it and they say, but, 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 but. They're false sheep. They're goats and that's why they're they're like billy goats and they're saying, but, 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 right? And that's bad. <laughs> it's a great distraction, a tantalizing distraction. They're thieves and robbers. They come in to steal, kill, and destroy. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. I love this expression, find pasture. This is a beautiful statement because he's talking about how good it's going to be in Christ. He will go in and out and find pasture. You're going to find food. You're going to find clothing. You're going to find shelter. You're going to find comfort. You're going to find peace. He's the good shepherd. Everything about life in Christ is awesome. Not everything about this world. I mean, look where we are. We're in a mess. We got stuff we don't understand. We're trying to deal with stuff. We don't know how to push stuff away or cause all the circumstances to vanish. We're, we're in the midst of a confusing time. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Next week, next month, it's, it's chaos. But everything about life in Christ is good. Everything about your connection with God is great. Imagine if you had to juggle this horizontal stuff and the vertical. Do you see what God has done? He's sent Jesus as a forerunner to take care of all the vertical. The vertical is over. If you have not grasped that yet, what we're saying is the vertical is finished. You are bonded with Christ. You are forgiven and cleansed perfectly. You are free from the law and dead to the law and perfectly accepted and loved. You are bonded with Jesus permanently and perfectly. The vertical is over so that we can deal with the horizontal. But most Christians, we're still wrestling with the vertical. We're trying to get right and stay right and get clean and stay clean and get in God's will and not fall out. And my goodness, how many ways... Can we say it? How many ways are we Christians neurotically chasing after the vertical when he's already granted all of it? And so he says, if anyone enters through me, he will be saved. I guess the question is, is he a liar or have you been saved? Have you been saved and how saved are you? Then you'll be able to go in and go out and find pasture. My yoke is easy as you're Faith in Christ, easy? Oh, don't say that, pastor. That's easy believism. Absolutely, it's easy believism. We can't apologize for that. The ego says, I've got to earn it. Jesus says, it's easy and it's believism. He says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. You will find rest, for by grace you are saved through faith, belief. By faith, it is not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. It's easy, and it's believism. we got to stop apologizing for this stuff. People try to label it in some ugly way to make it uh, look bad and discount it. It's by grace through faith. It's easy, and it's believism. It's believing in Jesus Christ to be saved. You enter through me, and he will be saved. He will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came so that they would have life and have it abundantly. It's interesting, this thief. I mean, growing up, I guess I just assumed the thief was Satan. And, of course, there's some truth to that. But in context, who have we seen are the thieves and the robbers? Who are the ones trying to climb over the gate and get to the sheep without entering through the door? Those are all the false teachers. Those are all the ones who were pushing religiosity. Yes, influenced by Satan. But watch out for messengers who don't carry the message. Watch out for false teachers and deceivers. They come 
and they will take your joy and steal it. They will take your contentment and kill it. They will take your faith in Christ and seek to destroy it. Fortunately, as we read recently, we're perplexed but not crushed. We're not destroyed. We're not forsaken. But the thieves, they're out there. Religious messages. People will walk with us for a time following the gospel message and then I'll get a message from them. What do you think about this teacher? What do you think about that teacher? Sometimes it's an outright cult. They don't know. They don't know the difference. They've been watching and listening to good, healthy stuff. A few teachers out there that they really love. And they're getting into the scripture and reading and poking and prodding and testing and making sure it's the truth. And then a buddy comes up to him and says, oh, you like that? Well, then you're really going to like this. And then 20 minutes into this new thing, they start asking Uh, This sounds a little different. I mean, seems like we shifted the goal from Jesus to money. Seems like we shifted the goal from Jesus to good health. Seems like we shifted the goal from Jesus to principles for success. Seems like we shifted the goal from Jesus to the sacrifices that I make for him through the Daniel fast and keeping the Sabbath. And doing the Jewish feasts. Seems like the focus got shifted somehow. And it did. And they don't recognize it at first. But eventually some alarms start to go off, don't they? The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I came so that they'd have life and have it abundantly. Jesus gets better and better. For you. Expect better and better. Never worse. He'll never let up. He's always good. He's always going to push his goodness in your direction just when you think you've got him all figured out. He's better than you think. Just when you think you've come to the end of recognizing how gracious and kind and good he is, he's better than you think. He says, Believing in him, you will not be disappointed. So he doesn't just promise life. He, he promises abundant life. And I, I, I hate that this has been abused over the years, but even the term the abundant life has been abused. It's been taken and put up on a pedestal as some sort of, I don't know, is it an emotional expectation, the abundant life? Have you bought into chasing after the abundant life Jesus doesn't say chase after it he says you have it you have it so maybe it's not emotions maybe it's not a feeling maybe the abundant life is him maybe the abundant life is Jesus but see if I'm not careful I bring in a few psychological ideas you know Uh, the abundant life is being well balanced the abundant life is, is, is being uh, well-adjusted. The abundant life is never feeling bad. The abundant life is experiencing no roller coaster of emotion. The abundant life is speaking healing unto myself. The abundant life is, and you fill in the blank there, but either we've had a physical expectation an emotional expectation or even a spiritual expectation of this thing called the higher life, the abundant life, the greater life, life on a higher plane. It's up there. It's far off. I can't quite attain to it, but boy, it's my goal. And Jesus never calls us to that pursuit. He says, seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened. You will stop hungering and you will stop thirsting Because he is enough. He is the abundant life. The abundant life is a person and connection with him. Not some experience that we need to chase. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I love this because the shepherd is the sacrifice. And there are some hired hands that we've already heard about. And they won't do the same. Apparently when the wolves show up, the hired hands are gone. 
They're looking out for number one. But what did Jesus do with number one? He allowed number one to go to the cross. He allowed himself to be the sacrifice. The shepherd became the slaughtered. And in so doing, he proved his identity to us. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, he sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters the flock. Again, who are these hired hands? Can you think of anyone in the nation of Israel who would be a hired hand, so to speak, over the sheep? Again, Jesus, in a roundabout way, which he has to explain twice, is absolutely bashing the hypocrisy of the Jewish leadership. I mean, he's coming at the church people. These are the temple folks. These are the the people that have been venerated and, and uh, you know, uh, respected in, in every way over the years. And Jesus is coming in and throwing a wrench in all the plans that they might have. He's called them thieves. He's called them wolves. He's called them names. And now he's saying, you know what? They won't stick with you. They've got their nice little sermon ready, their little law-keeping sermon ready for you, but when the rubber hits the road, they're gone. He flees because he's a hired hand and does not care about the sheep. What's different about Jesus? He's family. That's what's different. Jesus is family. He's not ashamed to call you brother or sister. He's family. His care for us is, ex- is instinctive. It's instinct for him. It's heartfelt. He's connected. He's not hired. He volunteered for the job. He's with you and in you, and it's genetic. You share the genes together. We're in the same family. His care for you is heartfelt. It comes from the gut, from the core. It's a connection that's unbreakable. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. I love this. This is my favorite verse in this passage, because there's two truths in here that are pretty incredible. First, he knows you. Come on, the real you, the you that watched four hours, ten hours of television this weekend. The real you, you know, the one that never misses a sporting event The one that watched Mike Tyson this weekend as he fought at 50-some years old, he knows you. Not some fake church Sunday morning view of you, you. He knows you, and he likes what he knows. He knows what he was getting, and he's happy about you. Do you believe that? Man, if there was one Christmas gift that I could give each of us, This season, it would be the gift of knowing that he delights in you, that he thinks the world of you, that he likes what he's got, that he knows you. Do you believe that? Also, my own know me, he says. Again, we're back to that instinct, that inborn discernment, that intuitive knowing. Look, maybe you're not a theology expert. Maybe you don't have the Bible memorized. Maybe you haven't gone to church your whole life. Maybe you don't attend Bible studies six times a week. But you know him. You know him instinctively in your gut, in your spiritual core. You're connected. He knows you, and you know him. He likes what he sees. Verse 15, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life, for the sheep. You know, I love father-son stuff. I mean, not just for me and Gavin, but I, I love to watch golf tournaments that are father-son golf tournaments. I love to watch sporting events that are about a father and a son doing it together. Um, and, and here, I, I, I guess the reason I love that is I just love to see the camaraderie. I love to see the genetic connection. I love to see them work together. I love to see the relationship and then the competition at the same time. 
what Jesus is saying here is, you remember how I just said that the Father knows you and that I know you and you know me? Well, it's the same. I know you as well as the Father knows me. And you know me. Now, this is heresy. I'm not allowed to say this this morning, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. You know me like I know Dad. Huh? You don't have a renewed brain. I'm not saying you've got a perfect brain in that head of yours. But spiritually, you know Jesus like Jesus knows the Father. And the Father and Son know you just like they know each other. That's what he's saying. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. That's how close we are. That's how connected we are. That's how instinctive it is. Yes, we're getting our minds renewed. Yes, we're getting growth and learning. Yes, but the instinct is fully there in, in full force. And I have other sheep. Oh, this is interesting. Jesus, you're, you're not allowed to talk about predestination and Gentiles. What, what, what is this? A little precursor, I guess. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also in, and they will listen to my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. That's pretty cool. We just got done with our big fat Greek wedding. You remember that series? The big fat Greek wedding, the invitation of people like us, Gentiles, non-Jews, into the fold. And Jesus, very early on, is tipping God's hand. He's showing us God's plan. There's another fold, not just you Israelites. There's another fold out there. Yeah, they don't have Moses. They don't have the law. They don't have the Pharisees and Sadducees. They don't have the prophets. They don't have the Old Testament history. They don't have any of that. But there's another fold out there, and they are going to listen to my voice too. I'm going to bring them also. And guess what? Not two messages. No, nope. not two messages, not two gospels. One flock, one shepherd, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Bringing them in together. What does this do for the folks out there, the, the folks that are teaching two messages? Oh, there's, there's a gospel for the Jews and there's a gospel for the Gentiles. Totally different. Don't ever, don't you read Peter now. Don't read Peter's stuff, just read Paul. Don't read James or John, just read Paul. Because see, you're a Gentile, so there's just one message for you. It's Paul only, Paul only. I mean, this stuff is out there. They will become one flock with one shepherd one Lord, one faith, one baptism. What does that tell you? One new covenant. And we're joined. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it back. Now, here's one thing I want to leave you with today. One final thought in this beautiful passage. Jesus volunteered God and Jesus are on the same page. There's a lot of stuff out there that makes you think you got saved from God. Do you realize you got saved from sin? You didn't get saved from God. God's the one who saved you. Jesus laid down his life voluntarily. Look at this. No one has taken it away from me, Jesus says. No one took away my life. No. I laid it down on my own. I have authority to lay it down. I have, a, I have a authority to take it back. This commandment I received from my Father. I did it willingly. Father, is there any other way? It, it, your will be done, but is there any other way? I'll take it. No? Okay, no other way? Then I volunteer. It wasn't God killing Jesus against his will. It wasn't God slaughtering his son against his will to save us from God. No. It was God sending His Son, His Son acting willfully and voluntarily to save us from sin. Let's go back to the garden. Did God kill Adam and Eve? No, He did not. He said, watch out, in the day you eat of that tree, you will die, and I don't want you to die. I'm not a death dealer, I'm a life giver. My friend Tim Chalice loves to say it, did you hear it? I'm not a death dealer. I'm a life giver. In that garden, 
He didn't say, I'm going to kill you. He said, watch out, you're going to die. Big difference. Jesus is not saving you from God. God and Jesus are saving you from sin. Big difference. At the end of the age, does God hand over those who refuse Him? Does God allow the consequences to occur? Absolutely. Is there punishment for the enemies of God? Of course. Is there judgment for those who reject? Yes, but it is the natural outcome of what occurred in the Garden of Eden taken to its final completion. But God is not hurling people into death. We chose death. Jesus provides rescue. God is giving us life. God and Jesus are on the same page. Jesus did this willfully and voluntarily. We're not saved from God. We're saved to God. God and Jesus save us from sin. And they save us to themselves. So what do we see today? Well, we saw a passage about Jesus being a shepherd. Maybe you grew up reading this passage, maybe you've seen it multiple times, maybe it meant very little to you. My hope, my prayer today is that you've seen that God is good, that we see God through Jesus, that God is a shepherd and a caretaker, that he's absolutely head over heels for you, and that we see the goodness of God through Jesus Christ. He's good, and he made you good. And he went out ahead to forgive and cleanse and make you righteous and invite you in and take care of you. He leads you and you know him and he knows you and he likes what he sees. He delights in you. He is our good shepherd. Let's worship him in prayer. Father, we adore you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you are our shepherd, that we can trust you, that We're family, that there's instinct, that there's connection, that we're on the same page, that we're genetically fused together, that we are born of you. We thank you that you care so deeply, that you brought us in. We weren't chasing you. We had no history with you. Most of us being Gentiles, we weren't seeking after you. We we weren't working hard to please you. We were minding our own business and you invaded our world and pursued us, chased after us because you love us so much. We, we love you, Father. We thank you for all that you've done for us and caring so deeply for us. We thank you for your goodness and we thank you for making us good too. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, and I hope that uh, over this series you're get, starting to get a picture of what we have been given and this gift that we're celebrating at Christmas time, this physicality of Jesus where he came and chose to, to come down and spend time with us and be a sympathetic high priest and know what it's like to be us and know what it's like to be tempted and um, enable us to be connected to him, connected to the vine, and then as we saw today, uh, that he's a good shepherd and what it means to have, uh, that we get to worship a God that is the gate, and at the gate is a person. And I love that uh, we know his voice, and there's a lot of other voices out there that are telling us that we need to do more and be more, and they're adding, it's Jesus plus this and Jesus plus that. And I like uh, how Andrew just said that it's Jesus plus nothing. And so if anybody's trying to sell us anything beyond uh, the person of Jesus that we know Uh, that we can go, that that is a a thief and a robber, a thief and a robber of our joy, and we can run the other way. And that's just a beautiful thing.